Good afternoon and welcome to Mi Microwave Chemistry Made Fast and Easy with the Discover SP. I'm your moderator, Michelle, and our presenter today will be Grace Vanier, Life Science Product Manager for CEM Corporation. Grace is an experienced organic chemist who leads the team here at CEM to develop new instruments and applications, as well as supporting our existing products. She has spoken at various conferences around the world and written numerous articles on microwave chemistry. We will have a Q&A session after the presentation today, so please go ahead and submit your questions through the question panel. Now I'll turn the webinar over to Grace. All right, well, thank you, Michelle, for the, uh, the introduction, and I'd like to welcome everyone to our webinar. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about microwave chemistry, and I'm specifically going to focus on how uh, Discover SP makes that uh, fast and easy to do. So typically when I'm in a lot by the live audience, I like to ask the question of our, my attendees, you know, what, are you currently using a microwave system in your, for your research? So the best way I can do this today is to stick out one of these little polls. So if you'd be kind enough to go ahead and make your selection, let us know if you're using, uh, currently using a CEM system, uh, using a system from another vendor, you use a domestic microwave uh, or if you're not using a microwave at all. Uh, there's no right answer or wrong answers on these. I just was kind of curious to see uh, who am I talking to today. So I'll give you another second or so uh, and then we'll get the results here together. Well, it looks like we're um, about an even split here uh, between CEM and no one using microwave systems. So uh, that'll be, uh, that's, that's great. Um, for those of you who are currently using CEM systems, um, I hope to be able to show you something interesting, something new, something you've not heard about before. Um, and for those of you who are new to microwave, I hope that uh, you find some interesting uh, information and uh, some tools to be able to help you moving forward. All right. so. First and foremost, anytime someone talks about using microwaves for uh, organic chemistry or for synthesis for any sort of application, I always like to talk about the benefits. Now these first three, you've probably heard them before, fast reactions, higher yield, and improved purity. You know, this is because the fact we can do it faster, we can cut down on things like side reactions, but then you also you've got things like uh, higher yields and um, improved purity because we can make things happen a lot faster, access chemistries and pathways that we're not normally able to, to access with conventional heating. But what I'd really like to focus on is the disruptive characteristics of microwave technology. And what do I mean by this? Well, unlike conventional heating, microwaves are rapid energy transfer. So there's a lot of, of energy coming from that microwave system varying from amount of power. So the Discover SP that I'm talking about today we can deliver up to 300 watts of power. And it's very quick, so once you turn the microwave on, there's 300 watts of power being applied to your sample. Whereas with conventional heating, you have to wait for something to warm up, and it takes time for that energy to get applied. And kind of along with this is it's an instant on and instant off energy. So if I turn the microwave on and then I turn it off, there's no more energy being applied to the sample. The same can't be said for conventional heating. That 300 watts is a large amount of power, um, actually, in the, the Discover SP itself, with the size of the cavity, you're looking at about 900 watts per liter of power density. And probably the most interesting is that you can selectively direct the microwave energy to your sample. So what do I mean by this? Well, what you could do is you can modify your solvent selection or you can modify your reagent selection so that you can either be heating just the solvent, you just want to get rapid, fast heating, or perhaps you might want to direct the energy to your reagents themselves. So you maybe use a more nonpolar solvent so that the, the reagents are what's going to absorb the microwave energy. So if you look at the, the published kind of history of microwave synthesis, you see over the past you know, 10, 11 years, there's been uh, quite an increase in the number of publications from about 2,000, just over 500, to now here in uh, just last year, 2011, more than 3,000 publications per year. 
And this has amounted to almost 25,000 publications over those past just 11 years alone. And so it really was in the year 2000-2001 uh, when the scientific microwaves became available and you could see this, this, this steady increase uh, in publications. And this is due to the acceptance of the technology and, and it speaks to how people are using this technology for their research. Now what I wanted to do today is focus specifically on the Discover SP and its key characteristics and what makes it unique. But the chemistries I'm going to show you today are by no means uh, representative of all the types of chemistry you can do. And we would be here for hours if I were to talk to you about all the different kinds of chemistry. But I did want to kind of list some different things uh, that have been done. Um, a lot of these chemistries you'll, you will recognize. One of the most popular and most uh, I'd say cited chemistry would be transition metal catalyzed cross coupling reactions. Those are, are one of the, the first areas that people started to do research with microwaves in organic synthesis. But you can see here lots of standard organic reactions that you would be using, um, either doing method development or doing total synthesis. And you know, a lot of this chemistry is just done in your standard sealed vials um, and, and, and um, at elevated temperatures, oftentimes above the boiling point of the solvent. Okay, so before I get started talking about the actual instrumentation, I want to give you just a little bit of background information about microwaves themselves. Um, just to make sure we're all on the same page and uh, give you just a little bit of information. So microwaves are made up of perpendicular electric fields and magnetic fields. Now it's this electric field that is actually responsible for heating a sample. Uh, by and large, the magnetic field does not have uh, any sort of play in the, in the heating of a sample or in the chemistry itself. Microwaves move at the speed of light, and the frequency our systems operate at is 2450 megahertz. And this gives about a 12.2 centimeter wavelength uh, for the microwaves. And what you'll notice if you've ever looked at a Discover SP is that the inside of the cavity is right about 12 centimeters, and that's by design uh, to be this, the size of about one microwave. And the reason for the selection of this particular frequency, uh, many people uh, uncommonly think that this is um, due to the fact that it's what heats water best, but it's actually um, it, there's certain uh, frequencies allowed for us to use by the FCC, and 2450 happens to work pretty well for most of our samples. And because they're used in your home microwaves, uh, the magnetrons are fairly inexpensive, and we're able to pass that, that savings on uh, to the customer. So there are two different mechanisms by which microwaves heat a sample. Uh, those two mechanisms are called dipole rotation and ionic conduction. Now here I have a cartoon showing what dipole rotation might look like. Now this is a very crude, crude uh, cartoon here. We have a water sample, and these are our water molecules here. And what we know about water is that it has a dipole moment. So what's going to happen is our electric field passes through our water sample. Our dipole moment of our water molecule will begin to align with that passing field. And then it'll, it will try to track that field as it passes. Now if you remember, I mentioned this disruptive characteristics of microwave energy. So this is where it's one way it's disruptive is that every nanosecond there's another microwave coming through. So instead of that water molecule being able to truly track that electric field, and as it's tracking, another microwave comes through, causing it to realign itself, and then causing essentially what you see here, like this wobble effect. So basically, this, this wobbling, this kinetic energy, is what gets translated into heat, and that's how we heat our samples. Now, ionic conduction is very similar. Instead of having your dipole moments aligning themselves with that passing electric field, you can imagine that if we had ions in the sample, we'd be doing the same thing. All right, so that was sort of a microscopic view of what's happening when you heat with microwaves, but let's take a step back and look more of a macroscopic. So what's the difference between conventional or thermal heating and microwave heating. So thermal heating relies on conductive heat. So what does that mean? Well, you have here, you'll have your hot plates, your oil bath, your heating mantle, whatever that is, that surface has to get hot first. And then what happens is the heat transfers to the outside of the vessel, then to the inside of the vessel, to the surrounding sample, and then is finally distributed throughout the sample. 
this is one reason why stirring is so important in conventional heating, uh, because you need to, to help disperse that heat throughout the sample. And what this ha what it results in is a, is a temperature gradient, where it'll be much hotter on the outside of the vessel and cooler toward the inner, inside of the vessel where the bulk of the sample is. Now something else to note is that when you turn off that hot plate, uh, many of you may have actually had this experience, you turn it off, it's actually still quite hot. So there's still energy there. So it's unlike the microwave heating I mentioned before, the, the instant on, instant off, you turn a hot plate off, it still has energy. And so if you left your sample sitting there, it's still going to be heated until that hot plate cools down. So the difference with microwave heating is rather than heating the outside of the vessel, the microwaves pass through the vessel wall to directly interact with your sample itself. So this could be directly heating the, the solvent, the solvent could be absorbing it, or so could uh, the reagents in your sample. So you see these little bright red spots. You can imagine that if we had a metal catalyst, say for example we're running a palladium catalyzed cross coupling, that palladium because it's a metal, will absorb that microwave energy very rapidly. And so, but it's surrounded by solvent, so that heat will be rapidly dissipated. So you're not going to see a significant increase in temperature, per se, of, your, of, your, of the solvent. But right there where that metal is, for that one instant, it's going to be very hot. And that's where that chemistry is taking place. And that's what we call this, this idea of localized superheating. And so that's, that's what we're talking about there. That you're going to have this little microscopic hot spot that's going to help uh, push the chemistry forward. Now again, as I've mentioned before, if you turn the microwaves off, there's no more energy being applied to the sample. The sample will still be hot, but you just need to rapidly cool that down. All right, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Discover SP itself, give you some idea of what the technology includes and how does it work. So this is the Discover itself. The Discover SP is a very small system. It fits inside of human hood. And the system is, is quite flexible. So it, I, I talk here about how it automatically adapts to your chemistry. So it can adapt to your polar ionic properties of your samples. You don't have to tell it what kind of solvent, for example, you're using. It, it does, that doesn't have to happen with the system. It can do lots of different volumes. And it actually can change. Uh, it can change the, how it's heating the sample based on the volume, even if the volume is changing. So if you're adding a reagent, slowly to the addition uh, or to the reaction vessel during the method. Uh, no changes have to be done by the, by the user. The system can adapt for that. It has a wide temperature range. Um, so I, I, you can get down to minus 80 with one of our accessories, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, and up to 300 degrees Celsius. And it can handle pressures up to 30 bar, uh, depending on what type of pressurized vessel that you're using. Now, it accepts a wide variety of different vessels, uh, including the sealed vessels, which, which most people are familiar with, with microwave technology, but also open vessels. So you can actually take uh, the standard laboratory glassware and put this into the microwave and run chemistry at reflux or at atmospheric pressure. So the open vessels, it can accept up to 125 mil round bottom. The sealed vessels, 10 and 35 as standard, and there's actually an optional 80 mil as well. Now the nice thing about the system is it's got large access to the cavity. So when this here is the pressure device, when that pulls back and you remove the sample, the attenuator, or what we call a microwave door, is, can easily be removed so that you can clean out the cavity or you can swap between different vessel sizes. So it makes it very easy to use the system. So I mentioned this is a single mode, and I mentioned a little bit about how we can adapt for the, the polar or ionic different uh, conductivity of the samples. And how we do this is with using self-tuning cavity. So what does that mean? You may not understand what that is. So this here is a sort of an a, a aerial view looking down onto the cavity. So here's the actual sample in the center. Here's the cavity. And then here's our magnetron. And we have a circular waveguide around the outside of the cavity. Now you also see here we have slots various intervals around the outside of the cavity. So what will happen is as the magnetron uh, generates the wave and it passes through the waveguide, some of these, the microwave energy will pass through these slots to the sample. Now here you can see we have uh, quite a bit of microwave energy coming in because we have a pore-absorbing solution. So say we're using toluene as our, as our solvent. It's 
not going to absorb microwave energy quite as well, so you're going to need more energy to heat that sample up. Now, conversely, if you have something that does absorb microwave energy well, you don't need as much. And so that's what happens here, is that essentially the, the amount of energy that's necessary for the sample will come through these slots and be absorbed by the sample to heat, heat, the, heat the sample to the desired temperature. Now, what's, what's, uh, what's interesting about the self-tuning capabilities is that if, say, for example, you're running a neat reaction, and maybe your reagents start off very nonpolar, but they go through a polar intermediate, you're not locked into choosing nonpolar, and then it's not going to be optimally tuned for that sample when you get to your, to your transition state, because this can continuously change throughout, throughout the synthesis and throughout the method. So the temperature measurement that we use is, a, is an infrared sensor, and it's situated at the bottom of the cavity. And this is, gives us an, quite an advantage because it's a volume-independent temperature sensor. So what do I mean by that? If you have a quarter mil of sample sitting here at the bottom of your vessel, you can still measure that from, from the IR sensor, since, again, it's looking at the bottom of the vessel here. You can go then up to, say, 7 mils in, in the 10 mil vial, and you're still going to be able to measure the temperature of that, of that solution. So that's, that's the, the advantage here, is that if it's in small volumes, large volumes, we're still being able to measure the temperature. And what that means is that we don't need to have many vials to accommodate all the different uh, different volume ranges that you may want to run. And what this also does is it reduces any error. So say, for example, you, you mean to put a 2 mil reaction into the 2 mil vial and you put it into a 10 mil vial instead, well, you might not actually measure the temperature accurately. And this way, you don't really have to worry about that. And so speaking of the vials, here are the two different vials that are available. These are the standard vials. I did mention there's an optional 80 mil as well. But these are the standard, standard vials. So there's a 10 mil vessel, and then there's a 35 mil. And you can see both of these use this very simple, easy to use pop-on cap. And uh, there's in this cap, you can't see it in this picture, but in the bottom side, there is a Teflon uh, layer, which protects the sample. So it's an inert, um, inert layer that's going to protect the sample from, from the cap itself. Um, so there'll be no, no concerns with uh, cross-contamination or anything like that. So the 10 mil vessels can do down to about a quarter mil to uh, 7 mil um, reaction volume, and the 35 mil can do 2.5 mils up to 25 mils. The 10 mil vessel can actually be run up to 30 bar. It's the 35 mil vessel. We do limit that to 20 bar. But both of these can be run to 300 degrees Celsius. Um, and again, these are just Pyrex-based vessels. Um, and there are options for uh, quartz. All right, so it's poll time again. Let me check to make sure everybody's uh, still there, still paying attention. So I wanted to ask another question. So what happens, or what can happen, when you run a sealed reaction vessel in a microwave that generates a gas? So the system can overpressurize and shut down. The reaction will not reach completion. The vial can fail due to too much pressure, or all of the above. So take a second, let me know what you think uh, is the right answer, or what you think is going to happen when you run a reaction sealed vessel that generates a gas. And we'll take a second here to get these answers in. Well, I didn't see the answer come through, but I'm going to go ahead and say that probably everybody chose the all of the above, and, um, and that's true. So any of those things can happen. So the, the problem with running a sealed vessel, oh, here we go. Yep, we got pretty much everybody saying all of the above. Uh, pretty much the, the problem with running sealed vessels in a microwave is that when you generate a lot of pressure due to a gas, that's either a gaseous byproduct, um, then that could be from decomposition, whatnot. The system often can can doesn't handle that very well, and so that's what led us to design our Discover SP, and it's the Activent technology. So the Activent is really the key technology or the key difference with the Discover SP when we introduced the system. All right, so 
what exactly does that mean? What is the active event? What is it doing? So here's a, I have a little cartoon to show you what's, what happened in, a, in, a, in the vessel and in, in the system during a, a case where it's generating a gas. So here we're heating up our 10 mil vessel. You can see here we're generating a gas. It's just a, a colored in brown to show you the difference in color. And then what happens is that at a programmed pressure, we tell the system, okay, I want you to vent off that excess pressure. So at that program pressure, say it was 200 PSI, the system will vent off, and I will tell it, I want it to vent 20 PSI. So it'll let off for about 20 PSI, and then it'll reseal the vessel. All the while, the microwaves are continuing to run during this time. Now you can see here we have a pressurized gas that is passing over top of the vessel. So if, for example, what you're running is uh, generating a corrosive gas, so say it's uh, generating some HCl, then that is this carrier gas will pull that, that HCl away from the vessel and push it, push it out away from the, basically away from the system itself, protecting the actual pressure device and protecting uh, also the user. So this is a, a unique technology. This is unique to the discover SP itself um, and allows you to do chemistries that you wouldn't normally be able to do in a microwave because of the overpressurization problems. All right, so let me show you a couple of examples of uh, how this can be advantageous. So here I'm going to show you a reaction where at the, in this particular example, we're not having to worry about being above the boiling point. So we're using, in this particular case, it's PEG 300. So the boiling point is 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 high, so we're running at 280 degrees and we're still below the boiling point. So any pressure that is generated when we're running this chemistry is from the reaction itself. It's going to be uh, gases generated from decomposition. And so here we're doing a, a palladium nanoparticle sy synthesis and running, as I mentioned, up to 280. So here you can see, here's our temperature getting up to 280 degrees, and now you can see here's our pressure very rapidly climbing and reaching pretty much right up to that 300 PSI limit of the system that we've set here. And so what we can do is we can actually vent, and then it reseals, and you can see the pressure beginning to climb slightly more, again, from the generation of the byproducts. And again, that's coming from the, the decomposition of the ligand here from the palladium. Now what you'll notice is that in our temperature graph stays pretty steady throughout the entire time here, and especially if you look here in the, in the point of venting, we're not having any loss of uh, temperature. And if you were to see a decrease in temperature, that means you are venting off uh, the sample. Now, again, we didn't expect we would have any problem with that since we are above the boiling point. All right, so let's look at a different example. So here's an, a, an example doing an N-Bach deprotection of an indole. So this is just a thermal Bach deprotection. Of course, these can be done um, using any other types of, uh, types of methods. But uh, this is just an example of the thermal decomposition. So what you can see here, we're running this in the seed and nitrile. So now we're actually going to be running above the boiling point of the solvent. But you can see we're generating isobutylene and CO2 in this particular case to generate our, our indole product. So what we'll find is that here's our, our temperature and pressure. So here's our temperature. And you can see here, kind of going along slowly, and all of a sudden you see after about six minutes, you start to see the temperature rapidly increase at the same time as the pressure rapidly increasing. So this is actually when the reaction is starting to, to essentially to take off at this point. So you can see the pressure rapidly increases up to that 300 PSI, and we put in the vents here, the vent points. So it vents basically five times to release off that excess pressure, and then you can see here temperature stays steady throughout that entire time. And this will allow us basically to drive this chemistry to completion. So we can't do this reaction thermally at high concentrations because of the, the high volumes of, of gases here. This is being done at more than one molar. And when we don't vent in the, in the microwave, we aren't able to push this reaction to completion because we reach the temperature limit or the pressure limit too fast and the temperature is unable to get up to the point that we need to get to. So again, I pointed out that we don't see any loss of temperature and therefore, and we also measure the reaction volume and we don't see any loss of volume. So we're not venting off any of our sample or any of our solvent. So we're able to take this, this chemistry and we're taking it above the reflux point to be able to make this happen a lot faster. So here's another example. This is the Novonagel condensation. So here 
um, this particular chemistry running at 170 degrees impurity. So again, slightly above the boiling point. So here we're going to be generating CO2, and there's also going to be loss of water, which will be in the gaseous phase at that point. So again, here's our, our temperature. You can see we're climbing up to temperature, and we very rapidly generate pressure in this particular reaction. Um, and so we send in our vent point. This particular time, we actually send it in at 200 PSI, so it doesn't make it all the way up to the 300. And we vented once, twice, and then you can see it slowly gets back up. So it's almost reached completion for the chemistry. And then we went the, the final time. But again, you see no significant drops here in the, in the temperature. So we were able to do this in three minutes. Um, and, and conventionally, at reflux, it would take about 20 minutes to get that to go to completion. And I should note, I guess, that with the fact that we're really, we aren't seeing any more increase in pressure here, that's really a good indication that the chemistry has reached completion. So if we had not vented, we would have stopped this reaction due to overpressurization, and we never would have reached completion. Um, and it was able to be able to run this chemistry at a larger scale than we normally would be able to. All right, so here I'm just going to give you one last example, and this should be familiar uh, for anyone who uh, actually received our, our newsletter. So this is actually a, a recent paper um, in ACS Computorial uh, Science um, for a group in Italy where they were taking uh, these indoles and making um, aerophile indoles. And what they found is they, sodium hydride and DMF with these uh, disulfides seem to be the best conditions to be able to do this chemistry. But unfortunately, when you run this chemistry, due to using sodium hydride, a significant amounts of uh, hydrogen gas is generated during the method. So they ran this conventionally, just, as, uh, just to try and see if they could optimize the chemistry. Running at 130 degrees for 10 minutes, they can only get about 2% yield. This had to run for about 10 hours to be able to get this to go to about 90%. Now in the microwave, uh, what they were able to do is ran this both with and without using the activant. So without, they were able to get about 40%. Because basically their, their reaction would stop moving to completion because there was no more power being put into the, the sample. Um, but then using the activant to vent off that excess pressure, they could push it up to 98 percent yield. So you can see here they did a whole range of different uh, different substrates to give uh, about 54 different examples, 90 to 98 percent, on two minutes, four minutes I think was the maximum amount of time it took. And just to show you what the um, what the graphs look like, so here this is actually data that came directly off of the software. So here's the pressure graph and you can see each of the vents along the way, and here's the power, staying pretty much steady at about um, 120 watts throughout the method. Um, if you, the can, method where they did not use the activant, essentially they, the power would drop after about less than a minute, and then essentially no power would be added to the sample. Okay, so I mentioned, I showed you some data, um, and I just want to tell you a little bit more about that. So the Discover SP comes with a software package that's called Synergy. And Synergy essentially is for uh, data management and also for operating the system itself. So I apologize, this picture is kind of small, but you can see here you've got individual users. So here's, here's me, that's Grace. So under my name, there would be a data folder and a methods folder. And each person has their, their data folder and their methods folder. And they can create subfolders within those. And each person, has these, these methods and these data are unique to that person. No one else can delete them. They can view it, but they cannot delete that information. And the system will completely capture everything, so all the temperature, pressure, the power. It also records any changes. So, if, for example, on the fly you decided you had to change how much power was being added. Maybe you started with 100 watts and you needed to increase that to 200 watts. It'll actually record that you did that, so in case you forgot, when you go back and look at that, you can actually see that, that, that data. And it generates a PDF that you can use for electronic notebooking purposes or whatnot. All right, so how, does, how do we program the activant then? Uh, and I'm going to show you how you would do this through Synergy itself. So two things to keep in mind is what kind of method do you want to do? So if you want to run a method that venting is not necessary, then this is how you would go about it. Now, many times when I talk to people about the activant, they express concern. They're concerned about what's going to happen to my sample. I don't want to lose my sample. My sample's precious. Well, you don't have to vent. 
that's only a feature that you use if you really need it. So the way you would run this if you don't want to vent is you're going to want to set the vent pressure, which we call pressure SP, and you'll understand that a little bit better when I show the next slide. You want to set that at a pressure that's above your control pressure. So anyone who's familiar with using microwaves, you'll know that there's typically a default pressure limit in the system. And so you can change what that pressure limit is. And you just want to make sure that that pressure limit, the control pressure, is below the vent pressure. So what that means is that if you run a method, if I can set my control pressure to 250 PSI, if the system reaches 250 PSI, it's going to essentially reduce the amount of power being added to maintain that 250 PSI. So you'll never get anywhere near the, the 300 PSI of the vent limit unless there's perhaps a runaway reaction or something exothermic or something might, might, might go wrong. Maybe you've added 10 times the amount of a reagent, for example. And then that's, it's essentially there for a, a safety purpose, for a passive venting, essentially. So just to prevent the vessel from failing, for example. Now when you want to vent, then you want to do the converse. You want to set that pressure SP below your control pressure. 200 PSI is a good starting point, um, but you might have to optimize that for your particular reaction. And then again, the control pressure, then you want to put that up to 300. So what does this look like when I'm creating a method? So here, you can see I'm creating a dynamic method. And you can see here is my control pressure. So again, this particular method I'm creating is for a, a method where I don't want it to vent. So I'm setting my control pressure for 250 PSI, and I'm setting my pressure for SP, the venting pressure, at 300. So again, this is just for that safety. Now again, of course, if you're running the 10 mil vials, you can take these all the way up to 435 PSI. Uh, this is just uh, an example here for 35 in particular. Okay, so one more unique feature I wanted to talk about with the Discover, and it's, it's unique to all of the Discover systems, not just the SP, is the capability to be able to run open vessel. Now, you may be asking yourself, well, why would you want to run open vessel? I don't really see an advantage there. Well, certainly you can, you see the, the same advantages for open and sealed with the rate enhancements over conventional heating. It's cleaner and it's faster, all those things we've talked about before. But how else can open vessel be beneficial? Well, there's no concern for pressure. Now, of course, I, I, I've told you about how, how the SP in the active vent can help relieve issues of, of excess pressure, but if that's still something that's of concern, you don't have to worry about that if you run open vessel, because if you're running open basically to the atmosphere, or you could be running it on nitrogen, but still it's not going to have that pressure there available. You can use conventional glassware. So say you want to try a reaction that you typically are running at in a 50 mil vessel. Well, you could take that same 50 mil vessel, stick it down inside the cavity here into the Discover, and you can run that same reaction. And what that gives you is the opportunity to run some larger scale reactions than you normally would be able to run sealed. So the sealed vessels are typically a 10 mil or 35. You can put up to 125 mil round bottom inside this, the cavity. Now, so probably the, the, the most interesting feature, though, is this last one here, where you can permit addition of and removal of uh, anything from the reaction mixture. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. Now, sealed vessels have their place. Now, certainly, to run the reactions pressurized to be able to get above the boiling point, those definitely have their advantages um, over the running the open vessel. So those are things to keep in mind. And you certainly will contain all your reagents if, you, uh, if, if you're concerned about that. All right, so I'm just going to show you one example here. This is um, an, an example out of North Carolina State University where they've developed this 2 plus 2 plus 2 cyclotrimerization. So in this particular um, this particular experiment, they're running this 2 plus 2 plus 2 cyclotrimerization um, with these diines in this particular alkyne and using Wilkinson's catalyst to form these benzene derivatives. When they used a monosubstituted alkyne, you can see doing this in the microwave, get 91% yield after 10 minutes at 130 degrees. And they did a direct comparison in the oil bath, same exact conditions, it's only 34%. So that's nice, nice proof of concept that the microwave is actually giving an, an advantage here. And they could do this also with the phenyl substituted derivative. Now, but when they went to a di-substituted alkyne, you can see the yields drop significantly, um, regardless of the different, different type of derivative. And they even took this up to 60 minutes of time to run this, this method. What they found is that this alkyne now is actually uh, susceptible to 
the uh, to the uh, oligomerization. And so what's happening is that the because there's a high concentration that alkyne in the sample and it's slower to react, it's actually um, having basically a self polymerization taking place instead of the actual desired chemistry. So what they decided was, okay, well, running this reaction at, in toluene, why not drop it down to being running um, at reflux, so now drop it down to 110 degrees, run it open, and then do syringe pump or slow addition of the alkyne to keep the concentration down form uh, for the reaction mixture. And so that's uh, that's what they did. And you can see here they were able to essentially almost double, in some cases, the, the, uh, the yield of the reaction um, running this in open vessels. So you can see there's a there's definitely an advantage there. So I, I didn't have time to talk about all the different uh, other features of the Discover SP. Um, but some of the things I want to point out is that there is an optional camera where you can actually see inside the reaction mixture and see, or see inside the cavity to look at the reaction mixture. So if it's got a change in color or if um, there's something precipitating, something like that, you can see that. Um, there's other features for automation. So if you want to do library synthesis, um, same thing here. There's a Coolmate. I mentioned that before, how it allows you to go to lower temperature, which is a bit counterintuitive. But you can actually run chemistry, say at minus 60, um, using the microwave energy to promote the chemistry and not have that, that subsequent um, heat. There's also a gas addition feature that allows you to add gaseous reagents. Um, this works quite well for hydrogenations, for example. Um, so that's, um, that's just another feature. But there's lots of different flexibility to the system, and that's something that's, that's pretty unique uh, to the Discover product line. All right, so with that, I'd like to just uh, finish up I hope you, uh, you've learned that microwave energy is an enabling technology. You can do lots of different types of reactions. I wanted to highlight the SP, but as I mentioned, um, there's lots of different types of reactions. You can do a simple literature search, and you can find probably dozens of examples. Um, and you get complete control. There's a lot of flexibility with these systems uh, for programming them, for how you want to run them. Um, lots and lots of different things you can do with the different accessories as well. And you can see from all the different options that are available there that it's, it's continuously evolving. And so you'll see new methods and new techniques and, and perhaps even new instrumentation coming down the line in the future. Okay, so with that, uh, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Um, and I'd be happy to answer um, any questions. Uh, I believe the moderator is going to push those through to me. Um, I did want to point out if you have any questions, uh, I have my contact information here at the bottom. You're also uh, welcome to, to come visit CEM.com, our website, um, to peruse uh, what we have there. It's got more information on the Discover itself uh, and our other products as well, like our Mars system, um, depending on you know, what your needs might be. Um, but again, so feel free to contact me um, or uh, uh, um, visit our website. Okay, so let's... Uh, Let's see what we've got here for, um, for questions. OK, well, I've got one coming through here. OK, this is a, an, an often, often asked question. Um, there's a lot of confusion about uh, temperature measurement and how important is, is temperature measurement and how do we do that. Um, so I mentioned how we have our IR temperature sensor. Um, but one of the, the big complaints out there is that it's not as accurate as, say, using um, a direct temperature measurement. We do have a fiber optic option as an as an available uh, way to measure temperature. But what we we have demonstrated is that the infrared temperature measurement from the bottom is actually quite an accurate method. Now, if you're going to use something like simultaneous cooling, that's when you want to uh, use something like a fiber optic probe. Okay, let's see what else we've got here. Um, okay. Um, all right, so question here about um, doing inorganic or um, material synthesis. Can this be done in the microwave? Absolutely. Again, didn't have time to get into those types of applications, um, but there's lots of examples out there in the literature, um, and actually microwaves work quite well. Um, and so um, that, that does work very well for this, uh, for this particular, particular type of application. Okay. 
can you bubble gas through the open vessel with, without the gas addition? Yes, you can. Um, what uh, you need to do, though, the only thing to keep in mind is that you do not want to use anything metal. So you'd have to use a, a Teflon tube, but that can be done and has been done. Actually, um, I know someone who's actually bubbled um, uh, hydrogen gas through their through an open vessel reaction. Okay. Well, uh, I see no further questions at this point. Um, I'd like to thank everyone again for your attendance. Um, and we will be making this webinar available on our website. Um, and I believe you'll be receiving a, an email link uh, with that. Oh, and I think we have another question come through. Limit to the gauge size for the syringe used to purge. Um, we have tested uh, quite large um, uh, quite large needles, um, like, like 12 gauge needles, the, the, the biggest that we've tested. Um, and they work, they work just fine for purging the, the vessels. So, okay. Well, with that, thank you again. Um, and we will bring this webinar to a close. Thank you.